All right, so let's continue. Um, this is more of a information kind of, we won't do an exercise with that. If you're using Symfony or Easy Publish, which is using Symfony, there is also a bundle. And with the bundle, it becomes more convenient to use this. Um, so for example, you have a method to tag a Symfony response with a cache rather than sending the tag header yourself. Um, you even have these annotations where you just say, uh, um, whenever this is called, um, then I want to tag the response with comment plus comment, and this is um, it's using the expression language of Symfony, so it, it will use the value of the ID here. When you have a, a request that's uh, fetching data, if the request is a safe request, so it's a get, it's something that can be cached, it will set the tags on the response. And if it's a post or something that changes, it will invalidate those tags. All right, uh, next topic in these advanced topics would be test-driven caching. Um, so this FOSS HTTP cache library has a, has a PHP unit tests to help you with testing your caching setup, so like functional testing. Um, and basically it has a base test that you can easily configure to start a varnish up for running a test and then do something and then um, test things. And we also use that, of course, to test the features of FOSS HTTP cache itself. That's what we started with and then we realized actually it could be useful outside of the library itself. You could use it to test your own things. Um, so let's try this. Um, there is this tests cache test and an exercise called post. And actually we'll see that now we have one test that succeeds and two that are skipped. And the idea is to uh, do what's explained here in the test file. So we have this first one which um, so one of the things you have is an assertion for miss and hit. And we just say, ah, if we fetch this and then we fetch it again, first time is a miss, the second is a hit. And between each test, varnish is restarted, so it will forget everything, so the tests don't interact with each other. So the idea would be to remove this line and go to... Um, here we have this invalidation. If you have not, if it's commented out, comment it in. And here you don't need to restart Varnish because the test is going to launch Varnish on a different port and doing that for you, it's not using the other Varnish. And then we're checking if Perch is actually working. So as soon as you have this commented out, in, whatever, not commented, then it works, or it should. Do you see green tests? Who is not green? Everybody green? Not really. And then this last one has this one is going to fail if you just uncommit this. And 
we will see that uh, there was a failure, um, there was a cache miss. The report is a bit verbose, but the upside is that we see what's happening. Because quite often uh, it, it can be the problem that actually the, for example, the response was a, an error, there was an exception, and then obviously the thing you expected to happen didn't happen. But if you don't see what happened, you would think like, oh, maybe it doesn't do the thing, and you don't realize there is a syntax error in the file. Um, so what we want to do is to change this t um, exercises post file. Which is here. And yeah, what we would want is to tell this this varnish client to invalidate So who is seeing green tests? Green, anybody? And then you have to flush because the client, you, you can on this uh, Proxy client, you can call perch and ban and whatever you want, and it's not going to do anything until you call actually flush. No. And when you use the Symfony bundle, the, the the idea of that is that after a kernel, like on the kernel terminate event, after the response is already sent to the client, it would call flash flush. No. So the request is not delayed by doing network requests to varnish. And also potentially the web client could do parallel requests to invalidate things rather than doing a request and wait for the response and then do the next thing. Yeah. Okay, so apparently the solution for that one seems to not work. Uh, so bonus points if you find out the right solution. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure it used to work. Um, or whatever. Well, I'm... Ah. Ah. No? 
well, whatever. Let's move on and talk about the edge side includes. So the, the idea of an edge side include is that you, you can have a page where most of what's on that page can be cached, but there is maybe something on it that cannot be cached, or there could be pages that you can't cache, but there is one part of it that actually could be cached and that's very expensive to, to render. And in these cases, you can use something called edge side includes, which the, the application will put in some place in the content, it will just put a URL and a special tag saying here, there should be something else that can be fetched at that other URL and Varnish will read the content and see, oh, so here there is a, there is this edge side include, so I have to fetch something else and include that, copy that there. And the, the main thing itself and every edge side include on its own can have their own caching rules. So Varnish could cache the main page but do a sub request each time the page is requested or could not cache the main page but when it does the sub request see, oh, I have that in the cache. And it's also Symfony can do that with a built-in support where in Twig you can just specify a controller and say this should be called via ESI. Uh, with a screenshot. So on, on this one, let's imagine that some kind of uh, information page, it doesn't change that often, but on the top right, you have something, well, I guess you can't read it that well, but it says like, hello, Mr. Whatever, and you can log out here. So this is individual content. It depends on the user. Um, then below there is this comment section, which probably updates more frequently. And then there is a form. And when doing forms with Symfony, you want to have this uh, CSRF token, so you, you need the session with the user. So this thing depends on, on the current session and either shouldn't be cached at all or, well, no, in the case of a form, it really shouldn't be cached at all. And, well, if you do Symfony, you would use this uh, Twig expression to say ESI, but the basic thing is really just this. You have this ESI include and then source and then some URL that is um, relative to the current URL or you start it with a slash to make it absolute, but it will go to the same domain. Um, yeah, that's just the detail if you ever want to do ESI in something like JSON data. Uh, it only does it on HTML unless you specifically enable it. In VCL, you need to add a little bit of information because if you don't, so this thing is telling the backend, um, like the Symfony application, hey, there is something in front of you that knows about ESI, so you can tell me these ESI includes. And if you don't, Symfony will see that and say, oh, I don't know if anybody is going to understand ESI. The browser is not going to understand that, so I better resolve it all myself. And then Symfony is doing, is doing the ESI, and you don't have Varnish doing it, which would be more efficient if Varnish does it. And in, in the response, we, if the backend said like, oh, actually I'm doing ESI here, then we, we need to tell Varnish to do it, to look for ESI information in the content. And usually we also want to remove this header, which was telling that there is ESI because the outside world shouldn't know or, I mean, it doesn't do any harm, but usually I 
prefer to not leak information about implementation details to the outside. And also, if there is something like some other servers in front of the varnish that would also be capable of ESI, they might be tricked into, into analyzing the content again and being less efficient. So let's try that. In the common VCL, there is this include for an ESI. And so actually, this one is 8888, not 8080, the port to get to um, Apache directly. So we just enable that. Restart, and then we can come with these requests. Um, right, and what you will notice when you just do that uh, is you get these two timestamps, one saying main body and one saying fragment, and they always change both, and that's because we, we still need to do something about them. Um, so, the idea is that um, the, the main page is really slow, so we, we simulate that by sleeping a second and then outputting the date. And what we want is being able to cache that. But this part must not be cached. So, so we can move that to a new file. And then here we, we tell it to include, uh, obviously, in HTML, not in PHP. Now it was still slow. And now it should be faster. Oh, well. Um, something didn't work here. Um, and what's not working is we don't tell 
about being able to ESI, so we, we need to do that. Uh, ah, now it's in the cache. And now we're good. So now this state, which is in the main body, doesn't change. And this one from the fragment updates all the time. So what we did is tell Varnish that we actually do ESI in this page and have this instruction and move the other part here. And then we can have different caching on different parts of the content. And as I mentioned, Symfony can do that uh, built in. Now you can enable it, and then you do this render ESI. Still alive? Still okay? I couldn't keep up the place. <laughs> um, and the, the ESI exercise is also in the solutions folder. Okay. So maybe have a look at that later. Um, so ESI is pretty cool. It has also its limitations because when Varnish is parsing the response, when it finds the ESI tag, it's going to do a call to the backend and wait for the response or call to the backend. It will look up the ESI URL and if that's not cached, it goes to the backend, comes back, puts that in. If there is another ESI, it repeats. So if you have like 20 ESI and each actually needs to do a call to the backend, your page is actually going to be horribly slow. So use it with caution or uh, still, it's not a magic bullet that solves all problems. Um, so one of the last topics for this workshop is about caching and sessions. So um, once the user is logged in, like the, the, the assumption is that he will see individual content, which in turn makes varnish whenever it sees the cookie, it stops caching, as I said. So um, one thing, is if you don't need a session, make sure that you don't trigger one. There is in Symfony, there is a cookbook page explaining what to do to avoid sessions when you don't need them. Because there is like one or two caveats that if you access app.session, it creates a session and sets a cookie even if you didn't want that. Um, or even if you have some pages where you need a session, try to destroy the session again, remove the cookie again. And kind of related to that, there is uh, some examples on the Varnish documentation how to clean up cookies. Because what you actually would want to know about is probably the a session cookie. But if you use stuff like uh, Google Analytics or some JavaScript frameworks, you might end up with cookies that were created by JavaScript that will be sent to the server. But actually, your server, your application doesn't care about them. And in VCL, you can rewrite the cookie header to remove everything but, for example, a PHP session ID. And then if there is no PHP session ID, it will become empty, and then you can remove the cookie header. And that way, you get rid of cookies that don't matter. Or in some situations, it actually can make sense to say, uh, we still do a cache lookup even if there is a cookie. And then either the backend will reply with the no cache header when the page actually depended on having a cookie. 
and otherwise it caches. But that's a bit dangerous if, uh, if some of the developers don't think about that and when testing locally there is no varnish so you totally don't notice that you created a horrible bug. Uh, another case for some situations could be to vary on the cookie header. So when you remember that screenshot before, there was one area with, uh, hey, you're logged in, hello, Mr. Buchmann, and that's something where it could make sense to vary on the cookie because I will see the same thing all the time, but you will see something different and he's not logged in, he does not see that or he sees a login link. So it, it depends on the cookie what you see there. And when using ESI, if that thing varies on the cookie and the rest uh, doesn't vary on the cookie and both can be cached, then after the first request, Varnish will just be able with the ESI to stick together the page from different elements from the cache. And then the last thing which is a bit more involved but quite interesting is this uh, idea of contexts where we say depending on what group you are in in the back end or on some information like this, uh, we decide, we, we split the cache on that. Um, oh, actually I copied that here, but whatever you find that on the varnish documentation, it's just some regular expression magic to remove everything but the PHP session ID. Um, then this one would be to, to remove the session in PHP. If you're doing Symfony, that will look a bit different, I think. But anyway, the, the basic idea is you set the cookie uh, to be valid until some time in the past, and then it goes away and the browser will stop sending the session cookie. So about this user context thing, it was actually a contribution by Easy Publish to the FOSS HTTP cache because it's something they apparently were doing somehow before and then they wanted to make it more generic, more general. And so the basic idea is this, you have the request coming in, it goes to Varnish. Varnish looks at that request and before it goes to the cache or goes to the backend with the request, it, it creates a request to the backend saying, with, with a special accept type, saying, I need some hash for this user. And the backend sees that. It has the, the cookie, it has all the authentication information it would have on a request normally. It determines the user. And then, based on that user, can create a hash, which typically in a Symfony application you would look at the roles that user has and then do some MD5 over the roles or something like that. So that everybody who has the same roles will have the same hash, everybody who has different roles will have a different hash. And then the hash is sent back, it goes to Varnish, and Varnish adds that hash to the, to the request and says like this is the, the the context hash, and now it sends the original request to the backend and looks in the cache, sees if I have this uh, hash on the request, do I have that in the cache? And if not, it goes to the backend. And the backend receives again a request with the credentials of a specific user, and then based on that, works, does the thing, decides like what is he allowed to see, what can he see, what can he do, renders a page, sends the response, and Varnish caches that, and the backend will use the vary header if the context actually mattered, it will say this varied on this context hash. If it's an individual thing, it might say, oh, this varies on the cookie, or it might need to say, like, you can't cache that at all. 
But the important thing is varnish would, if it was different just on this hash, it can store it and it can use the vary system to then cache pages of logged in people. Because if, if we're all in the same group for the application, we all have the right to see the same thing, we could share a cache. Only those people in a different group shouldn't share the same cache if, if the content only depends on the group and not really on the individual. So that's the idea of user context caching. Um, so we have a demo for that, which, so this one is really a, a demo and not something to code yourself today. Um, We'll have to to enable these. And here it is. So can go to this page. Uh, oh, I don't see anything here. Because the screen is so small. Um, yeah, whatever. What we want to see is, is that one. And so actually, even, even this forbidden page is now cached. So now you can go and log in. So my security of this example is great because I can just give a name and log in, and then I'm there. And when I go now to this, I, I get something. It was a miss, a reload, now it's a hit. I can go to my profile, I see the name that I choose for myself that was put into the profile. Um, and now if I delete my cookies, I get back to this thing, it's still a hit. And if I log in again as a different user, you can go here, it's still a hit. Now let's log in as an admin user. We go to this restricted page. This time it was a miss, even though it shows the same thing, but I'm in a different role now, so I had a different hash. Um, so the whole idea is that you can cache pages and that on the backend side you don't need to rewrite a lot of your application because you're still using the, the one actual user that had a cache miss to determine what is he allowed to see, what can he do. So the backend, when rendering a response, is not really the not really using that hash value. It's just using the real user that happens to be the one triggering the cache miss. And the hash is just there for Varnish to be able to vary on uh, on on the hash. All right. So we are getting to the end, till when is it? Oh wow, then we will have some time for questions or go back to some points where we went fast, if you still feel like it. So, you can really do very cool stuff with Varnish. You can also totally mess up your application. And I think the trick to stay with the cool stuff is really keeping the varnish configuration simple. Don't try to work around the broken application. 
make your application work first and just think it through. It's not really complicated. It's a few steps, but look at them, look what happens, and try to understand it and not just like, oh, I'm putting copy-pasting something and then see what happens. Because chances really are that it does what you wanted to see, but it also does a lot of other things that you didn't expect. Um, Varnish also has a bunch of interesting libraries, which they call vmods, which can do stuff like uh, basic authentication, where you can uh, specify a HD access file and Varnish is gonna um, check passwords on requests so that if, if you have, for example, some system that is not publicly available, we, we use that for a private API that we have for a customer where he has like lots of application all over the place, but only authorized applications should get in. So we do the basic authentication in Varnish to avoid putting the, the load on the back end to validate and find out that actually there is no basic authentication. Um, then in the examples we've seen all these header function things and yeah, it's, I think it makes sense to see it here in exercises to really understand that there is no big magic going on. It's, it's very visible. But if you write some project, if you have an application, try to use some framework that has a request and response objects. And if it's only for being able to start working on what's the body of the response and then you can still add things to the header, for example, which is something you can't do if you do plain PHP and just header and then as soon as you echo something, you cannot add more headers. Um, for the invalidation, this uh, FOSS HTTP cache client is really quite handy. It, it abstracts the things and makes you independent also from what kind of cache you're using. It works with the app cache of Symfony, it works with Varnish, and it works with Nginx. And if you have something else, then you could just write your client instead of re-implementing the whole concept. And if you're using Symfony, then take a look at the FOSS HTTP cache bundle, which provides all that as a service and, for example, allows you to configure the cache headers in Symfony configuration on, based on, on the URLs and such things. So like, basically, like you configure security rules, you can configure cache rules. So what's your next steps? Um, like once you put Varnish in front of your application, um, you really want to monitor what's going on so that you have some idea of what is, for example, the, the hit-miss ratio, like how many of my requests actually get cached. Because then if you realize like 95% mm, of all the requests do not generate cache hits, well, unless you're doing really something very individual thing or very, very low traffic so that the cache is always expired, probably something is not working as it should. So start looking at caching instructions at the headers and try to optimize the cache hits, try to see what could we do so that there is more hits and less misses could also be if you have a lot of query string the, in the URL, the part after the question mark, if, I don't know, if you have some JavaScript library generating the requests and the order of the parameters is not always the same, it's an example of, of totally unnecessary cache misses because for Varnish, the URL is a string and if it's not the same string, it's not the same thing. It goes to a different cache entry. But Semantically, it might be the same thing, so maybe try to make sure it's always in the right order or always in the same order. Another thing is uh, 
go read on, on the varnish cache uh, documentation. They have quite extensive documentation explaining a lot of things. Um, sorry. One more thing. Um, HTTPS is becoming more and more relevant because uh, you, you want your connections to be secure, you want your connections to be trusted. And the open source free varnish doesn't do HTTPS. Um, there is a couple of proxies that you can use just for the SSH termination. Uh, like one thing is HA proxy, which is also a quite interesting load balancer routing thing. Um, Another option is to actually pay the company behind Varnish to give you, there is, I don't know if it's called like Varnish Pro or whatever, there is some kind of commercial version of Varnish now which implements HTTPS directly in Varnish. Or you can put an Nginx in front of the Varnish to do that. So, um, well, not really wanting to say what I just told is irrelevant, but actually, in a lot of cases, what matters a lot more is front-end performance. So if your page is loaded in a browser and actually on a real browser in a real-world scenario, it takes like five seconds to load all the JavaScripts and the 15 images and then do a lot of JavaScript logic to actually render the page. It, it's honestly, it doesn't make a big difference if, if you take like 50 milliseconds or half a second to return the HTML. It's like the most important thing then would be to look at the browser first. Um, and another thing to look at is really application performance. Because you will have cache misses, always, that, that will exist. So caching is not really the solution for, for performance problems. It is more the solution for scaling. So if you have a lot of requests, then a cache will really, really help because it takes load of your backend application. If you just have like extremely slow things, on, on a back end, then putting a cache can be kind of a, a stopgap uh, to, to survive the situation and then you try to build something to warm up the varnish cache by doing the requests uh, periodically so that the cache is always fresh because if people hit the, do a cache miss, it would be very slow for them. But then the next thing really is to look into the application and see why is it so slow, can, can we make it better? All right, and I think that's it. Um, I will put these slides uh, somewhere on the internet and link that from the from the joined in page. I've seen there is a there is not only the NetGen site, there is also a joined in event for summer camp. So I will put these slides there if you want to look at them later. And if you have any questions, now would be the moment to ask them. Um, if at some point my cache is so good that if it goes down, um, then it, the application is uh, breaking down and the cache can't warm up because the application is too slow to handle all the traffic. Um, how do we have a tip on how to monitor when um, such this to, to monitor the traffic and to say? Now it's going to be critical, or um, if my, my cache is going down, how, how do I know if I can restart my cache at some point uh, be, uh, without um, putting the whole site down? Um, so we've actually experienced this situation where like deployments that invalidated the whole cache led to to like the whole thing not working for a while until it recovered and rebuilt the cache. Um, what you basically really want to do is 
monitor and, and have statistics to have an idea like how many requests per minute or per second do I have and what's the average time, what's like the extreme times that I see. And when you look at that over a longer period of time, you will, for example, you will see like, is it constantly increasing and increasing? And if it's like increasing constantly, then like the response times, for example, the load on the server, it, it's an indication that you're, you're running into potential problems. Um, but in the end, um, when you, and then you can also see like is there like a curve during the day of, of peak times and low times? Maybe you can time the deployment to that, which should already help. Because there is really, that can be the situation where if you go down at peak time, the backend will just be overloaded, or the alternative, you have so much backend over provisioning power that that it could survive that, but then you will have like a totally idle backend most of the time. So there is a trade-off. Um, I never did that, but potentially, if you go with with something like the Amazon cloud or some other cloud system, you you might prepare a new deployment and set up more instances for the occasion of, of the cache being reset. Could be something. It has one ish something built in to, I don't know, um, discard every second re request or something to, to let the application come up again? Um, not that I would know, no. Okay. It, it, it doesn't do any kind of throttling or things like that. So yeah, you, you would have to look, uh, I, I think the HA proxy I mentioned, for example, has that. So that could be something you put HA proxy and do the SSL termination and do some, some kind of limit how many requests you even pass on. But it's like it's it's a it's not a happy situation because then it, it's kind of this trade-off between satisfying some people and really angering the rest or making everybody wait. So it's it's really as I said, you you want to fix the back end to to be not too slow. Well, easier said than done, I know. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Yes, I have to give you the microphone for the recording. Um, as for the HTTPS topic, do you have any pros uh, and cons for the three solutions you mentioned before? Um, About TLS uh, termination? Yep. So, Personally, I, I find HA proxy quite neat. It's simple. It's really doing that one thing, termination and sending requests to other servers. It's not trying to do any magic things on top of that, which keeps it really like focused. Um, on the other hand, using uh, using the varnish, uh, whatever commercial version could be a thing if you want to avoid having even more systems. It, it keeps it a bit easier to see like, oh, okay, that's all happening in here. Um, but then you don't have the separation and also the, the HA proxy or some load balancer, like there is also some non-open source load balancer or even appliances. Um, and those are really, they, they can at the same time do the SSL termination and then spread the load on different servers and keep track of what's running and what's not running. So you probably want something like that anyway and then it can just as well do the termination. And usually if you have like this 
um, your server location, it, it makes sense to have the first thing or very early on you do the SSL and from then on inside your your system, inside your uh, hosting system you don't need to encrypt anymore. And if you would use SSL inside for the communication inside it just adds load to the systems and it makes it harder to debug what's going on. Does that answer the question? Um, as for performance, um, there are no big differences between the solutions? Um, I wouldn't have any numbers, so I can't tell when, when you go, like when you push it to the extremes, what would be the best case, but probably then it also depends on things like do you download big files or do you have tons of small requests? It, it can make so much difference. But then I think in, in general, like having separate machines for the, the termination and for varnish and for the web server is probably a good idea because then you can scale the layer that is the bottleneck. So if you realize like whatever, okay, varnish is like really busy and I have these 100 gigabyte of RAM in the machine and adding more RAM is just too expensive. Uh, you can add more machines or you realize like a one varnish can easily handle that but the backends are the problem so I just put like five application servers to scale that and I can go with one or two varnishes probably you want two so that when one crashes you're not dead but so splitting them keeps you more flexible okay thank you other questions? <laughs> Do you have experience with um, Nginx used as a cache? And um, how does it compare to Varnish? I, myself, I don't have experience with it. The FOSS HTTP cache is supporting it, so there is actually tests in it uh, showing that the purge and refresh work, but I, I never used it to cache, so I don't know. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, if there is no more questions at the moment, um, don't hesitate to ask me questions later. I'm still around tomorrow and tonight and happy to discuss about these topics with you. So thanks a lot.